Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Sherry Burgraff, and today I'm going to be talking about marriage and millennials. I was reading a disturbing article today about marriage and millennials ages 18 to 34. And out of a thousand people surveyed, 40% of them said that they would abolish the till death do we part vows and also that their parents were more religious than they are and that they're not going to enter or stay committed simply for God. My heart goes out to them on the one hand, but on the other hand, a large percent believed in what's called marital beta testing, where they can be in a non-committed relationship and just evaluate how things are going every few years or so. Our society has not painted a very good picture of marriage. For these millennials, many of them have divorced parents, perhaps remarried with stepbrothers and stepsisters, and blended families are not always the easiest because everyone brings their own baggage and hurt from the past. I feel for this generation, I really do. But I also wanna ask, what is it about permanence that causes such fear? I don't think the problem is the concept of I do because there's so many people that fall in love over and over again, sometimes to the point where they go from one relationship and then when love fades, they go to another relationship because they realize they didn't find the right one the first time. Whatever the reason, we are afraid to commit, afraid of failure, afraid of abandonment, afraid of being alone. Why walk into the unknown of forever when you can have the temporary peace and control of the here and now? But I believe this is a lie. Robbing people of the joy and the trust, the companionship and the oneness that comes from a relationship done right. Healthy relationships can and do exist, but unlike the passive approach we often take, we don't fall into those kind of relationships by chance. We have to choose them. We have to create them. We have to commit to them. And true commitment says, I do. As I read through this article, I wish that I could share these countercultural truths with every millennial who has been jaded and confused by the concept of marriage. Marriage is not about a lifelong happiness and fulfillment. When we go into marriage with that type of idea that it's meant for our happiness, we will be very disappointed. There is no human being on earth that has the capability to bring that type of joy into our lives because they weren't made to have that role in our life. Real marriage is not about being happy and fulfilled for the rest of our lives. It's about becoming the best that we can be together. Commitment and intimacy of marriage allows for life, life, lifelong growth, maturity, selflessness, forgiveness and grace as we learn to unconditionally love one another, loving another flawed human being, seeing their realness and loving them anyway. There is no greater love than one that's unconditional. And no matter what our family background, I am thankful that Jesus models that type of love for us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about learning to choose another person over ourselves. Because by choosing them, we are choosing to become greater in humility and strength, forgiveness and love. Marriage isn't about becoming happier. It's about becoming more like Jesus Christ. But ironically, in becoming better, we usually become happier. The large percentage that believe in marriage beta testing 
are only avoiding a lifelong commitment in exchange for the ability to jump ship if things don't work out the way they expect them to. There is a healthy form of beta testing. It's called dating, and it doesn't include living together. God's word tells us what marriage is. Let's take a look at the biblical truth about marriage. I believe with all of my heart and all of my marriage that this lifelong relationship called marriage, when done God's way, is one of the greatest blessings and joys and experiences on the face of the earth. Let's take a look at what God's word says about marriage. In Genesis 2, 7, God created man. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. After he created Adam, in Genesis 2, 18 through 25, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. And for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they both were naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You might say that this was a marriage made in heaven, but literally this was the first marriage on earth and when God instituted the covenant of marriage. In Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Let's take a look, continuing with verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does to the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Matthew 19, 2 through 9 says, And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them 
at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. Mark 10, 8 through 12 says something similar. And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the house his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This is a word to husbands from 1 Peter 3, 7. This says, Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. And that's how God intended marriage to be. It may be filled with questions, detours, U-turns and bumps along the way, but the right journey with the right person won't lead you to a dead end. The survey that I read today let me know that a large percentage of millennials don't want to stay committed to a till death do us part vow, not even for God. You may think I'm old fashioned or perhaps even somewhat extreme, but in a time where abortion and same sex marriage is legal and encouraged, it's times like this that call for radical views and for someone to stand for the truth of God's word. Thanks for joining me on Triple Extreme.